Excellent. Uh, well, welcome everyone uh, to our workshop on the Regional Resistance Management Plan for Southeast Asia under the ASEAN Full Army Worm Action Plan. My name is Dr. Alison Watson and I'll be your moderator today. And we have a very busy agenda. We've got an exciting lineup of international speakers to help guide us through this topic. Uh, we have saved time, however, for your questions. Uh, after each speaker has spoken, there'll be an opportunity then to, answer, to ask your questions and have a dialogue with each of the speakers. Now, before we start, I just want to tell you how to use the platform today. Uh, I also want to underscore that a recording of the webinar will be made and we will distribute that at least uh, or within one week after the session. And you'll be able to go to the ASEANFAWaction.org website uh, and to the Regional Resistance Project page and you'll find that recording there. So, so don't worry, you will be able to view this again. Um, for today, if you have any technical issues, I'd like you to maybe send a message to Grow Asia or send a message to Pranav and just share with us what is not working and we should be able to fix it. Otherwise, you can try logging on and off. Uh, number two, if you could rename yourself, that would be great if you need to. If you could put your organization behind your name, that would also be helpful so that we know who we're speaking to. Uh, three, this is the main way we are going to have a dialogue today. And it's really important that we get lots of questions and that we actually really talk about what people want to know, what you want to find out, what you think could be part of this regional action plan as well. So please use the Q&A box to ask your questions to the speakers. Now, if you want to just chat, for example, you want to make a comment, you want to thank a speaker, you want to share a link uh, or some resources that you have or highlight an important point, you can do that in the chat. And we also really encourage that as well. Now, of course, the main way we'll be actually interacting is through the Q&A box. There is a bit of a limited opportunity for speaking and you'd raise your hand or if you've got a problem, you can raise your hand as well and Pranav will see that. Okay, so I'm going to move on uh, very much in, uh, to our sort of first introductory speaker. And I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Andy Trisiono. Uh, Andy is a member of our project committee uh, that developed our concept paper. He is a professor in entomology in the Department of Plant Protection, Faculty of Agriculture at the University Gajah Mada in Indonesia. Andy has over 20 years of experience working on resistance related work and we're very pleased to have him taking a leading role in this work. Andy, welcome. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Alison. Um, today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our workshop on a regional management plan for resistance management under the Asian Action Plan on Paul Armeo Control. Over the last six months, a small project team has convened and developed a concept paper for this important work program. And I would like to thank to all the members of that project team for coming together and supporting that effort with your time and input. Today, we would like to share with you important work, research, and resources on this topic that make up our work in the concept paper. But firstly, I want to emphasize why resistance management for Paul Army Worm is important to all of us. Farmers need a range of effective, economic, safe, and acceptable approaches and technologies to control Paul Army Worm. A regional resistance plan is a vital because we need to ensure that Paul Army Worm population don't become resistant to different tactics and measures we have in our IPM toolbox. This is because fall armyworm, like any other insect, can acquire resistance to certain measures, and that resistance, once developed, takes away the power of this solution to control fall armyworm effectively. A coordinated regional approach is very important to prevent this resistance developing because fall armyworm is a fast moving transboundary pest. Therefore, we are only as strong as our weakest link in managing polar armyworm resistance. The proposed regional approach to resistance management, therefore, focuses on three specific areas. Regional polar armyworm surveillance and resistance monitoring. Second, 
country specific and regional for armyworm resistance management guidelines inclusive of all possible IPM practices. And the last one, integrating host plant resistance with other compatible IPM tactics for sustainable fall armyworm control in the Asia. You will hear all about all those three components today. Dr. Prasanna Burupali from CIMIT will be starting with a presentation about host plant resistance, the important and opportunities in this work for our region. Dr. Srinivas Parimi from Iraq will be expanding and, explain, and, and explaining the current management practices and resources and what are important considerations for resistance management. We will then have three speakers from Australia, US, and China presenting on the latest status and research on fall army one resistance. How can you be involved? You can download the concept paper and comment on the activities proposed by going to www.asian. We have also sent the concept paper to the government representative in each of the 10 Asian countries. I know that Alison also emailed all registrants yesterday with the link to the paper. Most importantly, make the most of the opportunity to ask all your questions in the Q&A box and to share your thought in the chat box. And now I'll give back the speaker role to Alison to introduce our first speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, and thank you for that very good introduction. And uh, Andy will join us at the end uh, also to provide a summary of the discussions today. So I look forward to that. And uh, thank you very much for your work uh, and your contribution to the concept paper and project group so far. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Prasanna, uh, Director of the Global Maize Program at CIMIT and the SGIA uh, Research Program on Maize. Prasanna leads CIMIT's Global Maize Program, which focuses primarily on maize improvement in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And he provides technical oversight for an array of multi-institutional projects uh, on Oh, good, great. He's already there. Um, on the development and deployment of improved stress resilient maize germplasm in the tropics, as well as novel tools and technologies for enhancing genetic gains and breeding efficiency. He is also a lead technical expert within our ASEAN project group on developing the regional management plan for resistance management. And it's always a privilege to have you join us, Prasanna. So welcome. And I'm just going to stop share and let you load your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alison. I hope uh, you can see my presentation. I can. Okay. It just needs to be put on yeah. full screen. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Prasanna. Okay. First of all, uh, thanks a lot, Alison and uh, the ASEAN uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak on uh, fall armyworm resistance management in the ASEAN and what's the role of host plant resistance in a crop like maize, uh, which is deeply affected by this devastating transboundary uh, pest. Um, insecticide resistance in fall armyworm populations uh, has been uh, now one of the major topics of concern and uh, several publications have emerged recently uh, on probing the genetic structure and insecticide resistance characteristics of uh, fall armyworm populations in different countries, uh, especially for instance in China, as you can see in this molecular ecology resources article, uh, as well as a comprehensive article on genomic and transcriptomic analysis unveiling uh, the population evolution and development of pesticide resistance. But if you look at uh, globally, uh, fall armyworm populations are known to be resistant to at least 41 active ingredients of insecticides across uh, various modes of action groups, including the carbamates, organophosphates, pyrethroids, and uh, some of the basal astringents is uh, uh, cry proteins. Uh, so this is uh, not just for Bt uh, proteins themselves, but also for several synthetic insecticides or pesticides that are commonly used uh, across uh, Africa and Asia. Uh, 
uh, a robust insecticide uh, insect resistance management program is very much an integral part of insect uh, uh, what we call integrated pest management for uh, control of insects like fall armyworm. Uh, so IRM has to be aligned with product stewardship in terms of preventing uh, or mitigating the onset of resistance in the populations uh, to the insecticides, whether they are synthetic or Bt in nature. Uh, and a better understanding of fall armyworm population dynamics and the resistance profiles across the ASEAN region will definitely help us to guide the present and future fall armyworm response strategies. Uh, but implementing this is not an easy task. Uh, task. It's, it requires a, a holistic approach and well-coordinated and joint actions uh, by the industry, the academia, uh, farmers, government agencies, uh, etc. So this is, this is exactly what we are proposing to do uh, in the ASEAN Regional Resistance Management uh, for sustainable uh, management of fall armyworm. So as uh, Andy pointed out, it revolves around the three specific but highly complementary actions. One, the regional fall armyworm surveillance and uh, resistance monitoring. Uh, the second, of course, is country-specific and regional resistance management strategies uh, implementation of these. And third, uh, how best we can integrate host plant resistance with other compatible IPM tactics, including biological control, environmentally safer pesticides, uh, good agronomic practices, and so on. So this requires not only robust scientific data generation, but strong partnerships among academia, industry, and farmers. And most importantly, it's not an issue that can be resolved by one country. It requires a very strong regional cooperation. So no country can succeed alone. Uh, and this, uh, this, unless and until countries come together and work together in a coordinated way, we cannot achieve success. Uh, coming to the host plant resistance, uh, host plant resistance is indeed one of the pillars of integrated pest management. Uh, we can define this as Beck did in 1965 as the collective heritable characteristics uh, through which a plant species uh, may reduce the probability of its successful utilization uh, as a host uh, by an insect species. Uh, host plant resistance is typically uh, two different uh, uh, actions are involved. One, you can have a transgenic resistance or you can have native genetic resistance. Uh, transgenic or BT resistance typically offers high levels of resistance because of antibiosis, uh, but mostly is either it is monogenic in nature or oligogenic when you are trying to combine uh, different cry proteins or uh, BT proteins. Um, because of its uh, high dose uh, strategy, most of these uh, transgenes do exert high selection pressure on the insect. And uh, therefore it requires a, a coordinated insect resistance management strategy uh, to delay the evolution of insects resistance to that particular proteins that are being deployed in the GM crops. Uh, on the other hand, the native genetic resistance uh, do not offer though that high level of resistance on a Davy scale if on a one to nine, if transgenic resistance is around one or two, uh, the, the typical uh, resistance offered by native conventional or native genetic resistance is in the range of uh, three or four or five. So therefore it is not one or two, but at the same time, it is polygenic. It exerts low selection pressure on the insect and sometimes moderation uh, helps in terms of population genetics. Moderation is the key. Uh, and it is, uh, it's important to delay evolution of resistance. So it has its own advantages. Um, the efficacy and the benefits of Bt maize in fall armyworm control are undisputed. Uh, wherever they have been deployed, they did offer uh, significant levels of protection uh, against uh, fall armyworm. And uh, recent articles coming from uh, even Asia uh, confirm this, the importance of uh, genetically modified maize in combating uh, the locally prevalent insect pests, including fall armyworm 
or stem borers. Uh, but when you look into the different events that have been deployed uh, in the two ASEAN countries, Philippines and Vietnam, you can see uh, I have highlighted in, uh, in red those single gene events, uh, which have been uh, there since long. Uh, for example, Monet 10, which is Cryo-AB based in 2002, BT11 or cryo AB again in 2005, Monet 9034, is a combination of two different genes. So it's a stacked gene. So therefore, I'm putting it in green. Uh, TC1507, Cry1F-based. Uh, MIR162 is a, again a stacked event. So you have a combination of single gene events and stacked events uh, for protection against insect pests uh, in maize in Philippines. Uh, looking at Vietnam again, here you have again BT11, a single gene based as well as MONE89034, which is a stacked uh, event or a dual event. Uh, what is the relevance of this single gene versus stacked events when it comes to uh, insect resistance management? Uh, there is indeed uh, uh, undisputable proof that there is a high risk of uh, rapid evolution of resistance to single toxin BT maize by Falamiwam populations. In 2005, when Bates published this article uh, uh, with this beautiful figure on insect resistance management, what contributes to that uh, in terms of high dose or refuge or resistance monitoring, regulations, cultural controls, and other IPM tactics? So this is one of the one of the best figures that one can ever see on the insect resistance. At that time, in 2005 there may not be more than three or four cases of, of populations, insect populations evolving resistance to BT toxins. But by 2016, this has grown to more than 16 such cases across different BT crops. Uh, so far, in fact, has evolved resistance to Cryo-AB maize in Brazil and the Cryo-FA based maize in Argentina, Brazil, Puerto Rico, and the Southeastern uh, United States, as has been documented by uh, various groups. So this is, this is not a hypothesis, it's a reality, uh, and it has to be dealt with. Uh, the elements of an effective uh, insect resistance management plan therefore has to be based on several major factors. We need to learn from the experiences in other countries. Uh, we need to deploy the products in a way that can effectively reduce the selection pressure on the insect, monitor the changes in the insect's susceptibility to the expressed protein, monitor the fields for signs of unexpected levels of damage that could be uh, due to a key target pest where it is not anticipated. And undoubtedly, there has to be a broader stakeholder participation uh, in the development and dissemination of insect resistance management plans uh, with a strong understanding of the local cropping systems. In all this, communications and education at various levels is the key. And uh, there are excellent papers published on uh, uh, framework for insect resistance management programs. I particularly like this one coming in 2020 in frontiers in bioengineering and biotechnology uh, that helps us understand what are the lessons learned with regard to BT maize IRM programs, taking into account the Busiola Fusca, uh, the stem borer uh, resistance development uh, in case of South Africa. So we do need to constantly look for those lessons and incorporate them actively uh, and in a focused manner uh, in, uh, in target regions like the ASEAN. When it comes to the native genetic resistance, shifting gears here, uh, there is an incredible genetic diversity in the maize land races. Simit's Germplasm Bank at Mexico holds nearly 27,000 such collections. Uh, 24,000 of them actually come from Mexico itself. Uh, you can look at this diversity and uh, this figure I reproduced from the one I published in Journal of Bioscience about uh, nine years back. Uh, you can see just from uh, Mexico itself, there is such a beautiful diversity. You can see from a, a very small uh, maze here to uh, one of the longest maze years that you could ever see, almost 
35 to 40 centimeters long ear of the hala uh, in Mexico. That's the kind of diversity that you see in maize. One of the most important land races that contributed to fala mimam resistance uh, from Mexico is this Tuxpeno land race. Uh, and uh, so Tuxpenos coupled with the Cuban flints or the Caribbean flints uh, offer resistance to some of uh, uh, the insect pests like stem borers, uh, post-harvest pests like weevils, larger grain borer, and even fala mewam. Uh, a team of uh, scientists at CIMIT in 1980s and 90s led by John Mim, um, who departed uh, uh, two years back, um, unfortunately, uh, developed some excellent populations like multiple insect resistance, tropical and multiple borer resistant populations using these uh, diverse sources of land races with demonstrated resistance to insect pests. And through that, CIMIT has uh, derived multiple lines uh, with, uh, with insect resistance. When the pest broke out in uh, Africa in 2016, when it is documented, in, by 2017, we established uh, uh, a very large greenhouse complex at our maize experimental station at Kibako in Kenya. There are 13 such greenhouses uh, which uh, offer us a capacity to deal with insect uh, screening against fala mewam under artificial infestation. Uh, and every year we screen thousands of materials. Uh, so more than 6,000 cement maize germplasm entries, including those from Mexico, those from Africa, uh, were screened against fala mewam, uh, again validated through subsequent seasons. And this led us to an understanding of uh, which particular in bread lines uh, are offering resistance to the fala mewam populations in Africa. So this sort of work needs to be replicated in Asia. Unfortunately, there is no money invested uh, by donors on such work in Asia. And this is the need of the hour. We do need to strengthen our efforts to breed for fala mewam resistance uh, in Asia adopted genetic backgrounds. But in Africa, where we did this work for the last three years intensively, we identified a set of inbred lines uh, that are excellent in terms of offering resistance, like that CML71. You can see side by side uh, CML71, which is highly resistant compared to CML395, an excellent line, a drought tolerant line, but highly susceptible. CML338, again, excellent for fala mewam resistance. Uh, CML574 versus another very popular inbred line from Africa, which is CML444. Uh, you can see the level of susceptibility side by side under choice experiments. So a set of these lines have already been disseminated to a wide array of institutions across Africa and Asia for them to kickstart their breeding programs for uh, developing resistance to uh, in their local genetic backgrounds. But what is really important is to come out with products like this, the fala mewam tolerant maize hybrids, not just under uh, choice experiments, but also under no choice experiments, uh, where we partition the screen houses uh, and uh, each partition, each compartment is grown with only one particular hybrid. And then again, you challenge each plant with neonate larvae, at least seven larvae per plant at the V5 stage. And you can see here excellent sources of resistance amongst the hybrids identified compared to the commercial benchmark hybrids, uh, which are hardly yielding one to 1.5 tons per hectare compared to uh, under no choice artificial infestation, we get around uh, at least six to eight tons per hectare. Uh, in a set of three, first generation fala mewam tolerant hybrids are now available to partners. And these are already being tested under national performance trials in several countries across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, including Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, South Sudan, and so on and so forth. So more than 10 to 12 countries are presently uh, testing them through their national performance trials. And hopefully by the end of this year, and in some cases, by the first quarter of next year, uh, one, two, or all the three of these fala mewam tolerant hybrids uh, would be released across several countries 
in sub-Saharan Africa. We do need to replicate this model in the ASEAN region. Uh, if we have to be successfully and sustainably controlling the pests, not just through pesticides uh, or through other natural biological control agents, but actually uh, coupling them with host plant resistance. So integrating host plant resistance with other compatible IPM tactics in the ASEAN. So from my perspective, there are four, uh, four suggestions. One, we need to use uh, host plant resistance in concert with other tactics. Be it BT maize, be it native genetic resistance, they need to be used in combination with good agronomic practices, biological control, and proven biopesticides as part of an insect pest manage, in, manage uh, integrated pest management and insect resistance management strategy. Avoid or reduce as much as possible exposure to single toxin Bt crops uh, that can indeed diminish the durability of the Bt pyramids eventually if they are deployed in some countries. Uh, if we deploy A in one country and then again after six, seven years release B uh, and again after four or five years if you try to release A plus B it is bound to be much less effective than uh, introducing strategically uh, BT pyramids uh, in target countries. So our suggestion is to uh, introduce BT maize pyramids producing two or more uh, toxins that are each highly effective against falamivam and as far as possible encoded by linked genes. If you put them in different genomic regions, there is a chance of segregation. Uh, but if you introduce as uh, possibly linked genes uh, in a particular chromosome, then the opportunities for segregation will reduce drastically uh, and uh, you will have a better management over that uh, linked genes. And transfer the BT-based resistance into appropriate Asia adopted genetic backgrounds, especially those with native genetic resistance to falamivam and other climate resilient traits. Remember that farmers need improved crop varieties with higher yield and multiple stress tolerance. That means once those offer yield stability and not just falamivam tolerance. So you enhance the probability of success of your, of your varieties if you if you try to put this BT-based resistance uh, in a native genetic resistance background, to me, that is a, a wonderful strategy in terms of delaying insect resistance uh, or evolution of insect resistance. You are then combining um, a monogenic or oligogenic uh, trait uh, with, uh, with polygenic resistance that is typically conferred by uh, con uh, or seen in case of falamivam resistance. So that's, that's the, my quick take on this. Thanks a lot, uh, Alison and uh, colleagues in Croatia uh, for your wonderful support to this whole uh, initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prasanna. That was excellent. Uh, and there was a lot covered in that presentation as well. Uh, I wanted to ask you some questions and just remind everyone as well, if you could put your questions in the Q&A box, that would help me uh, a lot today. Um, first up, I have a question for you here. Um, hello, should resistant hosts be used even in the case where the fall army worm was not yet reported as a preventative tactic in North Africa, for example? Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Even if it is not reported in a country, actually there are now practically very limited countries out there uh, which have never, which have not reported fall army uh, it The pest has invaded uh, practically every major maize growing country uh, in Africa as well as in Asia, uh, except in a few countries in North Africa or in the Sahel region. Uh, so as a proactive or a preemptive strategy, uh, it is important to, to deploy, at least to begin with the native genetic resistant varieties. And if the country has a well-evolved uh, regulatory system, political will and commitment to deploy uh, transgenic products with good product stewardship and insect resistance management strategy, then it's wonderful. Uh, but if not, there are options available and uh, those options, as I highlighted, uh, provide smallholder farmers an opportunity to protect their crop uh, in the event of falami worm outbreak. But remember, 
this is not a single silver bullet. Uh, either transgenic resistance or uh, or native genetic resistance should not be considered as a silver bullet. We do need to effectively integrate them with uh, uh, other IPM tactics, the compatible IPM tactics. Uh, so are the other cases, uh, neither biological control or biopesticides, they don't work alone so effectively as they work in combination with other uh, practices. Excellent. Thanks, Prasanna. That's a very important point. So I'm glad you emphasised that. I'm sure our other speakers will, will follow that up. Uh, I have a question here. Um, did you study the mode of action of the resistant plants, of the, the native genetic resistant plants? Yeah. So there have been studies conducted uh, on uh, uh, lines, inbred lines with falamiwam resistance coming from CIMIT, and uh, as well as those lines that are developed in uh, USDA ARS Mississippi, and those are temperate inbred lines. So in fact, some of those temperate inbred lines were derived using CIMIT's multiple insect resistance tropical populations. So there was an active exchange of germplasm between CIMIT and USDA ARS uh, in 80s and 90s that led to development of lines. And these lines are compared. Uh, for example, MP705, some of the CMLs were compared with the susceptible inbred lines. And all the three mechanisms could be seen, not only uh, antibiosis uh, due to metabolites like terpenoids, like uh, alpha, uh, the, the karyophyllins, uh, but also silk mace in involvement in some of the resistant lines, as well as morphophysiological characteristics like a very tight husk cover uh, are all contributing to uh, the, the combined effect of tolerance or resistance. So there is no one specific path through which uh, this native genetic resistance is manifested. You do see multiple mechanisms involved. And there is no single gene uh, or a major QTL that controls resistance in all the CIMIT lines. Uh, our initial studies using GWAS uh, and now being validated uh, through, multi, uh, through biparental populations at, uh, in Africa have clearly uh, shown that there are multiple genes involved in uh, manifestation of native genetic resistance. We are also probing into the metabolite analysis related to uh, um, resistant lines versus susceptibility. So a lot of opportunity to understand better, uh, but initial studies show that there are multiple mechanisms involved in uh, the polygenic resistance behind uh, native genetic resistance. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, a question here, and I think this is gonna be sort of two questions around what is your plan to distribute the newly developed resistance maize varieties by SIMIT? And the second question to part of that is, if you, you, you have facilities now in Kenya and India, if you were thinking in Southeast Asia, is there one country or does it not matter which country you base it in? You can be diplomatic here, but. <laughs> Okay, let me first answer the, the you see, the, the hybrids that we have, uh, we are now partnering with the national partners uh, across around 13 to 15 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, going through the national performance trials. So they are already licensed to the national programs. And once the varieties are released, we will non-exclusively license to a large number of seed companies for scaling up and commercialization. The reason why we are going for non-exclusive model is because supply is less than demand as of now. Uh, we have less number of falamibam tolerant hybrids compared to the demand. But as, as more and more products come out of our pipeline, we will also be geographically, uh, we will be providing uh, geographically limited exclusivity to some of the seed companies which are very strong in certain countries so that they could be rapidly amplified and seed can reach. And by the way, if some of the Asian countries are interested in white maize hybrids, here is an opportunity, just let me know. Send me an expression of interest and we'll partner with you in deploying them uh, in target geographies. But what we are doing right now is transferring this uh, insect resistance from the white maize materials, as well as the yellow maize uh, resistant lines that we identified in Kibako in Kenya 
into Asia adopted genetic backgrounds. So this work will take uh, a few more years of two more years at least at Hyderabad before we come up with, uh, with similar products like what we did in case of Africa. Uh, remember in Africa, we didn't take more than three years, uh, three to four years maximum to come out with products. And we expect the similar rapid success in Asia too. But when it comes to setting up similar infrastructure, it all depends upon the ASEAN region. This decision should be left with ASEAN. Uh, which countries are best suited to establish such a kind of an infrastructure, but most importantly, uh, develop international public goods, not just for the benefit of the countries uh, in which such an infrastructure is created, but benefit, for example, our Kenya facility is now helping the entire Sub-Saharan Africa. If a country in ASEAN comes up with that kind of a model and says that there'll be no restriction in terms of germplasm flow from that country because cement germplasm is involved and uh, to any partner, any institution across Asia, that's the kind of model that we would like to uh, go for. Excellent. Very good. Very diplomatic and very well said there, Prasanna. Sorry. Uh, question here is, um, certainly host plant resistance is the first line of defense to manage insect pests like fall armyworm. Resistant maize may initially suppress fall armyworm population. However, is there any case of fall armyworm adaptation to a resistant maize? Since this is polygenic resistance and with multiple pathways involved in it, as I mentioned, involvement of silk maize and involvement of uh, uh, morphophysiological traits like trichomes, uh, tight husk cover, and uh, involvement of even metabolites that can repel the insects are not allowed to feed it so well, like uh, the terpenoids. So all these, all this means that there is no single gene or a few genes that the insect can easily defeat. So to me, uh, it's, uh, it's not like a brown plat hopper resistance uh, where there is a single gene that corresponds to one particular biotype and so on. Here, there are multiple genes involved. So I don't envision that host plant resistance to fall armyworm, especially native genetic resistance, can be broken down so easily. Uh, and again, as I said, if we combine it with other IPM tactics, it's going to be even more powerful. Uh, and if you put a BT event in a host plant resistance with native genetic resistance, then you are impro improving the chances of uh, uh, delayed evolution of insect resistance to that. So these are, that's the reason why we considered this particular component as a key element of insect resistance management. It's not simply doing host plant resistance for the sake of it, but having a clear vision of product development and deployment strategy that can delay the evolution of fall armyworms resistance uh, over a period of time. Excellent. And that's a good place to end that presentation, I think, um, with that strong vision there, because I think that is a really important piece of this concept document. Uh, and uh, very well said, Prasanna. Thank you so much for uh, presenting today. And thank you for your work uh, in developing the concept paper with, with the experts and in leading that uh, process. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, and just before I move on, Prasanna, there are some questions in the Q&A box. If yes, you could I go in. Excellent. I will, I will go through them and answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Prasanna. And now it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Srinivas Parini. Srinivas is working as the Regional Resistance Management Lead uh, for Asia Pacific uh, for Bayer. And he's also the chair of the Asia IRAC, the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. And he's been a active member of our project group on this work and it's a, it's a pleasure to have you join us and if you could uh, share your screen. Thanks Alice. Um, one second. Let me, let me let me know when you can see the screen. Okay. I can see the screen. Thank you. It, it's a very thank you Dr. Preston. I mean you made the job easier for me actually to talk about uh, this topic on resistance management. That's a very nice introduction. And I took the liberty to answer a few questions. So uh, you please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, having said that, uh, uh, resistance management is a very broad topic. And when you look at Falarmiwam, it's, it's even more bigger. 
and and we all talk about it a whole lot but what we can do at the ground level is is practically implementable at the farm level that's what we need to look at when we really have to take some of these tools from the toolbox having said that uh, uh, what i would like to do in this presentation is take through few of the iraq recommended guidelines and how we as industry uh, kind of work uh, to support this follow me on management in, in any geography and with more specificities towards uh, Asia and ASEAN region. So uh, there, are, there are lots of products, insecticide products, and few BT technologies, which uh, Dr. Prasanna already kind of mentioned about, uh, that are available in ASEAN. In fact, ASEAN region is the only region where BT corn, as on date, is grown uh, as a product, uh, approved product. Of course, China recently coming in with its approved events. So just to focus more on ASEAN, uh, these are some of the insecticide modes of action that are available in ASEAN. There, there could be many which are used, but what, what we recognize that that have some sort of efficacy are, are these modes of action. And, and modes of action that I'm talking about, you know the group numbers that are mentioned in the left side uh, column. And, and these are all very important for us to understand at the farm level when you implement them. So the mode of action labeling is one of the primary activity of Iraq and crop life uh, uh, in the stewardship perspective. having having mentioned about this mode of action, there are very few modes of action which are actually providing uh, very good efficacy against Fallarmiron. And, and you can see in the right-hand side, rightmost column, how the performance rating of some of these modes of action is, is happening at the ground level. And this is, this is just a qualitative indication. Uh, it does not indicate any individual product or individual uh, you know, brand that's available there. And, and it's a general qualitative assessment that uh, the, the spinosines, uh, the insecticides of ivermectin group and diamides are the most efficacious uh, insecticides or modes of action available for us in ASEAN today to manage the pest. Besides them, we also have few BT technologies that are cultivated. Uh, Dr. Prasanna gave a list of them, uh, which are approved uh, in, in uh, Asian context or ASEAN context. However, as on date, there are only two, two three sets of techno three technologies that are widely grown. Um, and, and those are, a couple of technologies are based on Kryven AB gene. And there are two stack products uh, sold with two, uh, two or more genes. And one of them is Kryven 105 and Kryven AB2 based products. And, and the second one is Kryven AB plus Kryven F based product. So just to let you know that there are, there are three different uh, you know, technologies uh, that are available for control of polarmium when you look at the BT products, okay? For the next couple of slides, I'll briefly explain to you how insects develop or polarmium kind of insects develop resistance to insecticides. You may have seen this slide, but just a refresher to you that when you keep spraying the same insecticide, when I'm saying same insecticide, insecticide belonging to the same mode of action continuously, that's when insects become less sensitive and they start surviving to these sprays. So when I'm, when I'm talking about this, say you take, for example, a one mode of action uh, from the previous slide that I was discussing, and you keep on spraying the same mode of action again and again and again, you see this, these yellow individuals, which are these reddish color individuals, which are naturally present and, and in the environment, they start increasing in the numbers as we progress and come here. So the yellows and reds start increasing. And this is actually the shifts that happen. And, and this is exactly what we will be monitoring when we conduct a resistance management plan in a country. So resistance monitoring identifies these individuals to some extent when we really uh, uh, conduct studies in a region. Alternatively, the best practice would be that you alternate these, these applications of 
the one mode of action with a different kind of mode of action, which would render more protection to the crop, meaning that the insects that in, in general would survive the one mode of action would not survive the second mode of action and the number of individuals that would be going to the next generation would be lower as against when they're using only single mode of action. So this way, the pest control options would be more sustainable. Let me explain to you with a, a kind of a calendar-based or a window-based approach that IRAC recommends. So when you look at the corn crop as such, when you divide the corn crop into different windows of 30 days, you will have a first window, second window, third window, possibly a fourth window, okay? So pictorially, when you're looking at here, when I'm saying a window, it is equal to 30 days, which actually represents the time period for an insect to go through one generation. It may not be as precise or it may not be so perfect. There may be overlapping generations, but the window in general is an arbitrary 30 days that is set. So when a farmer goes into the field and sprays one insecticide from one mode of action on the first day of the first window, you, he, should be, he or she should be able to apply insecticide with a different MOA in a sequential window, that is in the second window. So when you look at the representation at the bottommost panel, the strongly recommended IRAC uh, mode of application is that you spray one insect set from mode of action one in the first window, mode of action two in the second window, and if possible, mode of action three in the third window. But you cannot keep on spraying mode of action one every single time you enter into the field. Okay, this is very important. We have been talking about it time and again everywhere, but the, the sense of it is very difficult when you go to the practical uh, application, you know, scenarios in the field level. So. Don't worry about overlapping generations. Don't worry about how many insects are there. If there, is, if there is a sense that you need to spray and you think that that is a recommended threshold in your country, go for the first spray. Scouting and monitoring helps us to do that, which I'll be discussing in the next slides, okay? So IRAC has guidelines that were developed a long time ago in 2016 or 18, if I always I'll kind of forget, and what we did is that uh, Iraq International's Lepidopteran Working Group built upon this and, and they came up with a new guidelines that would really help us drive, uh, you know, at the farm level in Asia and Africa uh, to manage fallar mill. So it is done in three steps. One, incorporate the agronomic actions, which I'll be showing you. Identify the pest and decide when to treat. There are still issues with right identification of the pest in spite of us talking about many identifying marks. So it's a refresher and a kind of a reminder to us that please identify the pest. Don't just jump in and start spraying it. And finally, you control the insect using IRM principles. So when I said incorporate agronomic actions, uh, I think uh, Dr. Prasanna touched based earlier on about IPM uh, practices. All cultural practices that you follow in a field will help dilute any kind of surviving insects that would affect the crop, not just during the current season, but also in the following seasons, okay? So the step one is to keep in mind of these, you know, agronomic actions you could do. Before planting, remove all the volunteers and cover crops. You plant early with the first rains. You start scat you know, scattering these planting dates in a region. You are giving a very good crop continuum to the insect to survive. So try to avoid that. If possible, get into a community approach in a village or a small city or a province and start growing or planting this crop at the same time. Most importantly, destroy the infested plant parts and crop residues. These will have a lot of resting stages or larvae sitting in there, which would be waiting to move to the next crop when it comes up. And above all, although it's easy to say control weeds, if you have a weed control options, please use them. We have seen 
फॉलर मेवाम सर्वाइविंग ऑन वीड्स मेनी प्लेसेस अक्रॉस ग्लोब सो ए गुड वीड मैनेजमेंट एंड ए क्लीन फील्ड विल हेल्प यू रिड्यूस दिस कैरी ओवर पॉपुलेशन identifying pest we have spoken about it please try to identify the pest properly look do scouting regularly once the crop emerges 0 to 45 days is very 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 important time for us to do the scouting and monitoring and follow the recommended practices whether it is ipm toolbox from the ipm toolbox which is including insecticides and biopesticides or bio control agents whatever is available in the country as i mentioned you need to follow the irm principles i i quickly uh, addressed upon earlier how modes of action needs to be rotated beyond this you also need to remember very carefully that use those insecticides that are recommended do not go for off label use and illegal products which in fact may not provide the necessary control and so this highlights the fact that the irm principles and ipm principles go hand in hand and everything done under ipm will help in resistance management having said all of this how do you how do you see the success of these practices and one of the good ways is to monitor the resistance development the pest while using all the tools in an ipm toolbox and this is done with an effective resistance monitoring program which this project is going to be focusing on uh, in many many countries in asia when you look at the insect resistance management using bt technologies i already mentioned that there are three uh, products based on three technologies available in asia one of the most important thing is the effective dose and use of a refuge i think dr prasen already addressed about it uh, the key would be to use two or more mechanisms of action which provides better control i think entire industry is working very hard to address and bring products with two or more mechanisms of action or modes of action you call it it's very important that to know that industry is working towards this and we already have products in hand which are grown in asean um we also need to do resistance monitoring which is being done in the cultivating countries either at field level as a as a performance monitoring or at the lab level uh industry also works together and does a lot of regulatory outreach in terms of refining these plants and conducting uh, com compliance surveys when the products are sold and most importantly we always work towards bringing new generation technologies into asean and 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 i believe each of the industry has its own new products in the pipeline in spite of doing all of this the key here is to have appropriate hybrids i earlier was addressing a question uh from dr siva that whether we can use susceptible lines of course susceptible lines are key for refuge but it is just that agronomically they should be equal to the bt hybrids or bt varieties that come into the space because that pro provides that agronomical synchrony for us to develop and provide uh, a right refuge or effective refuge in the environment most important i really want to harp on this for next few seconds that for follow me on management we 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 should consider a holistic multi stakeholder approach uh, we have been talking about ipm toolbox continuously but we also should be basing it upon clear evidence based advice to farmers many many farmers in asean except in the countries in philippines and vietnam do not even know how some of the products work and i think it is time that these products are enabled for Uh, you know these farmers to be uh, you know kind of visit and see with their own eyes how it's working and make a decision on whether they want certain products in their country or not uh, specifically to highlight here a country like indonesia which has a large chest corn growing you know area acreages i think it's very important that we see that some of these bt technologies which are already proven are 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 uh, you know kind of Uh, enabled for farmers to see their uh, performance in indonesia uh, access to technology this again goes back to my uh, evidence based uh, you know provisions to farmers uh, that regulatory system should be able to enable this access to technologies to products and technologies uh, in in countries where uh, it's it they need it 
most importantly, the stakeholder coordination. I believe, I strongly believe that this project and, and ASEAN action plan will provide a very good platform for the stakeholder coordination. I think stakeholder coordination was very important earlier in North America and in South America, and it's going to play a major, major role in managing this pest. We somehow need to learn how to live with it now. That's following on. So we might as well come together and join hands to uh, build a strong multi-stakeholder approach for managing this insect. These are a few of the key takeaways that I thought I would leave it here. And, 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 and although I didn't touch base upon scouting, uh, it's, it's very important as part of IPM to do scouting. When you have a product or a technology planted in the field doesn't mean that you, know, you encourage pharma to sit and, 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 and not bother about the crop. No, scouting is very important. And I, with that, I just want to stop here. And Great, thank you. Thank Alison. you. Thank you yeah. so much. That was very good. Um, excellent. Lots of information there. And I've got lots of questions coming in. We'll have to be quite quick. We're a bit tight on time, but that's okay, okay. because I'm going to be rapid fire here, Srinivas. You're going to be answering them. Uh, okay. You know. I'm done. I'm prepared. <laughs> like, a, like a game show. No, um, seriously. Um, are there, now, we, we had this before, and this was mentioned actually in the previous presentation, but I think this would be a good introduction to the questions. Are there any BT corn, single gene as well as stacked, reported to have become resistant to fall armyworm? It's uh, the BT single genes that are actually that reported resistance or is in. Uh, South America and Puerto Rico, and it's to the Cryven AB and Cryven uh, F and Cryven A105, which actually was impacted due to the single gene resistance. Okay. And it's mostly in South America. Yeah. And, and so I think you mentioned this, but you have, and I think Prasanna also mentioned it around these, you know, single gene events. They are used, that BT corn, in the Philippines. And I think there was an example in Vietnam as well. Is that right? And if so, I think also Prasanna said that it's quite important to introduce maize pyramids producing two or more toxins that are each highly effective against fall armyworm. I mean, is that, would that be your sort of comment? I mean, given that you have resistance that has already uh, turned up in South America with those single events, is it important to move away from those and move to stacked or pyramid hybrids? I, I, I kind of agree with that. And I think that's, that's what I mentioned that industry is working towards bringing these uh, stacked hybrids into the uh, countries, cultivating countries. And, and that's the need of the arm. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and just, to high, just to kind of mention there, there is no BT resistance reported or even close to saying that in Asia, it's all on the other side of the world, just, just so that we are, we are aware of it and be clear on that. Yeah. Excellent. No, thank you. That's good. Um, here we go. What needs to be done to get universal mode of action labeling in the region? Uh, that's, that's pertaining to insecticide. So a mode of action labeling is based on the grouping that's, uh, uh, that's kind of done by IRAC and CropLife. And, and it's, it's universal. And, and it is more to the countries in each of the regions or, or in a continent to approve a mandatory labeling or a voluntary labeling. So in ASEAN, as on date, uh, I believe Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, if I'm not wrong, Vietnam, uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but these are the countries which have some uh, mandatory labeling that kind of is uh, operating now. Uh, other countries are voluntary labeling or there is no answer to that, uh, but it's more driven based on the country regulations but the universal grouping and mode of action labeling is already there for insecticides, fungicides, and even herbicides now. Okay. Here's a question here around um, is, oh, sorry, is how are pesticide cocktails or mixtures practiced are quite common? I'm not sure it doesn't quite make sense by farmers. Oh, how do these pesticide cocktails or mixtures practiced uh, by farmers, and which seems to be quite common, affect resistance management? That's an excellent question. Uh, cocktails means there can be one. Mixtures are generally, you know, uh, if they are legally approved mixtures, that's a different context altogether. Uh, but if, it, if you're talking about illegal products, 
Yes, they bear a lot of impact on resistance management because we, we are entering into an area which is unknown. We don't know what that cocktail has. We don't know what that mixture has. And that would become very critical, uh, uh, you know, when we look into overall management in an area. And, 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 and if you're monitoring for one insecticide, whereas a cocktail has two, three other, which would impact the insect in a minor way or a major way, then we wouldn't be knowing it. So it's, okay. it's very complicated. Cocktails and mixtures, that's one of the reasons you don't encourage immediately, uh, by, uh, particularly at the illegal products level. Yeah, no, definitely. Difficult. I yeah. think that's very good advice. Um, a question here around, can, can you mix uh, or, or use rotate, I guess, uh, biopesticides and conventional pesticides uh, in, as part of a resistance management plan? Absolutely. If they have value, why not? So it's, it's just that, uh, you know, most biopesticides, uh, you need to look at their stability and how long their efficacy or residual action, we call it, and, and definitely should be using it. Uh, the only thing is, if you're mixing it, please check your label recommendations and compatibility recommendations if there are any. So some, at times, the insecticide may impact a biopesticide. So please check okay. for, your, for the recommendations of the product. Great. Particularly the bio, particularly the biopesticide side, not the conventional pesticide. You know. Okay. A couple yeah. more questions here. You seem to advocate clean weeding, or I guess cleaning up residue that was left uh, around the crop as an important fall armyworm management tactic. Doesn't this go contrary to the promotion of natural enemies? That that's a good question. So it, it's a, it's a choice. It's a choice, or how do I say, a balance between what do you do at the beginning of the season for weed management perspective? You don't keep on spraying herbicides to just kill the weeds anytime they come up, but at least it's a balance between what you want as a weed management perspective, but crop stubble destruction is a recommended practice in many places. And I don't think natural enemies dwell on, uh, you know, in crop destroyed or how do I say crop stubble that's left uh, in, in, the, in a field. And, and that's very important for you to consider that that uh, probably there will be more fall army worm in it than the natural enemies. Excellent. And yeah. I guess just just before we go, I think um, Chris is uh, this is having a question here. It was actually quite similar to the alternating the pesticide mode of actions um, by inserting biological control into uh, IRM schemes. Um, Hence, shouldn't conservation and augmentation biological control become core components of insecticide resistance management against fall armyworm? That's, that's a question. Well, Chris, good question as always. And, and uh, like, I, like I mentioned, any, any, any tools from the toolbox which would help sustain a product is always good. And, and if, if you're talking about ecological engineering, kind of or uh, conservation kind of uh, uh, tools, once we understand them better in the Asian context where the agriculture is on commercial scale, uh, it's not a subsistence agriculture as we see, uh, like, like we see in some African countries or Sub-Saharan Africa. Once we understand that if it's working, why shouldn't we include it always? Excellent. Yeah. Great, and um, I, there's some quite there's a quite a few questions left in there for you, Srinivas, If you could answer them, and there's also one okay. from Wilma in the chat box. Wilma, if you could put them in the Q and A box, that would help. But it is very much around uh, seeking cooperation from the industry to make the event test strip available, so we can verify whether the plant damaged is in a GM field or not. So I'll let you answer that in the Q and A's in the chat, Srinivas, because we have to go to our next speaker, but thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, as Michael, always, sure. uh, excellent and lots of information and also practical advice. So it's, it's perfect. So thank you very much, Srinivas. Thanks, Alison. And I'd now like to introduce Tech Tay. And Tech, while I'm speaking, introducing you, if you could load your um, presentation. I'm hoping that will be fairly easy. Uh, Tech is a lead scientist at CSIRO Australia. He has re research experience in molecular evolutionary and population genetics and specialises in applying next generation sequencing techniques 
to characterize the metagenomics of insect pests and to provide in-depth understanding of genome diversity in highly invasive insect pests, including fall armyworm. And that was, that was a bit of a mouthful. So um, I'm going to hand it to our expert, Tech, who's going to explain uh, what he's actually doing uh, in regional resistance management uh, related work. And it's, um, it's looking a good presentation. So welcome, Tech. And we can see your screen uh, clearly. Can you hear me, Alison? I can. Okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation. So I'm going to talk to you about the work that we're doing at uh, CSIRO. And uh, so this work was funded by, or is, is still going on, uh, it's funded by GRDC, uh, which is a Grains Research and Development Corporation. And also uh, with uh, money from other industry partners like the Cotton Research and Development Corporation and also federal government, government bodies, uh, ACIR. And we have a, 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 a few partners from Southeast Asia, from Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, and also have some latecomers, uh, South Korea and Papua New Guinea. Uh, they provided uh, material for genomic sequencing. But in the other project partners uh, from, from this uh, pro other project partners, they are carrying out our assays as well as providing uh, material for genomic sequencing. We also have a Ugandan uh, colleague, Dr. Andrew Kalibi. Uh, he's looking at the uh, management of uh, the four army worms in Uganda uh, based on farmers' experience. So the, the work uh, involved testing out uh, <clears throat> bioassays in the first instance. Uh, a sweep of biases which are listed here at the, at the bottom. Um, and also the partners uh, have a choice of selecting various uh, insecticide or BT compounds to test and do the bioassay against the four army worms. So uh, the Australian bioassays came from two populations, Kandanara, which is in Western Australia, and Walkerman, which is in Queensland. The Walkerman population is the first population of four army worms detected on maize crop uh, that happened in around January, uh, uh, early February in, in Queensland. And Kananara happened around March to April. So these populations were sent to CSIRO and we use it to do uh, diet incorporation uh, bioassay for quarantinilipole, indoxica, amamectin and spinatorum. And we use this to test on the second and early third instar larvae. For surface treatment, we do BT and VIP toxins on neonates. And this included uh, commercial uh, BT compounds uh, products such as Zentari and Dipel. And we also do topical applications. Uh, these are on third to fourth early, uh, early fourth instar larvae. Well, and we weigh the, the larvae so that we are sure that they're averaging about 30 milligrams each. So the results have been communicated in media release. I encourage everyone, uh, I know there's uh, some 180 plus attendees, to visit the GRDC portal, which is here, and see what the, the bar assay results are. These are in conjunction with uh, the state government agencies such as New South Wales DPI. They also provided their about essay results. So these are all uh, provided. Uh, you, can, you can see what the result outcomes are from the GRDC website. But what I actually want to talk about is what we found from the about essay results and how that uh, I help us to identify what are the other research gaps that are needed in order to better manage this uh, highly invasive and highly, highly damaging uh, insect pest. So in the first instance, I want to talk about the bioassay results, but just selecting on uh, a few compounds and compare that with uh, published data, such as the ones uh, that was published in 2020 in, in, by Indian researchers, and looking at the similar compounds that were uh, <coughs> conducted by the USDA uh, Louisiana uh, University uh, researchers. So first of all, they 
there are some compounds that are overlapping, so such as spinatorum. We can see that looking at the LC50, the toxicity or the potency ratio between the Indian populations and the US population, which represent the native population, so the invasive population and the, the native population overall, seems to have the similar response. This include Queensland and the Western Australian population. Now, if you scroll down and look at chlorine trinilipole, we can see that in the US and the Indian population, also similar as is within a few folds of difference. So this could be explained by simple biological differences between populations. However, in the Western Australian populations, we're seeing that it's going up to about tenfold difference. So this is getting a bit interesting because this is, we're supposed to be dealing with a single introduction of populations coming from Africa all the way across to Southeast Asia and into Oceania. Now, if we look at Indoxacarp, in Indoxacarp, the Indian invasive population and the US native populations are almost one-to-one. -one, so there's no difference there. And the Queensland population similarly, is about three to four folds but the Western Australian population was seeing up to 40 folds difference. So this is quite significant in terms of our bioassay response, the potency ratio. That means that in the Western Australian population for endoxica, the you require 40 times as much endoxica to kill it. And this is unexpected for a population that is supposed to be coming out from Africa all the way across to the rest of the world unless selection is very fast on this compound and on the populations of all armyworms. This remains to be seen. Now, if we look at resistant alleles in terms of molecular characterizations, this has been done by various groups, such as by Ralph Nauen's uh, group uh, in Bayer. They look at Indonesian populations and de they detected specific mutation in uh, various uh, loci for the BGSC and the ACE1 uh, loci that are present in Indonesia but not present in Africa, for example, or even in native Brazil populations. This could be easily explained by the fact that they were actually sampling effects. However, if we look at the literature which are published, there have been various international groups, especially by the Chinese, uh, researchers where they look at similar mutations for the, the same loci. And again, in China populations, we didn't see this, the mutation that was detected in Indo Indonesia. This is somewhat surprising because we we're expecting that it went, the, the incursion went from Africa to India into China, and then perhaps also coming down to Southeast Asia. And likewise, uh, another group, uh, from Nanjing University, which we are partners with. Again, we don't see the, the mutation that was reported in Indonesia. So taken as a whole, this number here represents, represents the number of individuals so far that had been analyzed for the same resistant genes, for the same mutations. And we're seeing that we're getting significant number of individuals that are being tested, and yet we don't see the mutations that are present in, for example, in Indonesia. Now, Southeast Asian populations hasn't been fully characterized, so this will be very interesting to know what are the diversity of resistant alleles that are present in these regions. And what does it mean? I'm not going to go into this very much, except to say that we, as the current hypothesis, the introduction is, is supposed to be a single introduction involving fairly limited number of, of founders and therefore likely quite low genetic diversity and going across into Asia and coming to Australia. So the fact that we are seeing diversity differences and about as a diversity di uh, response differences and genomic diversity differences suggests that there might be other uh, factors under, underplaying the, the current observation. <clears throat> and it's important to understand that we might be looking at multiple introductions. So if there were multiple introductions and looking at here where this is Australia, we can replace it with Southeast Asian countries. If there were multiple introductions, we, the populations are currently not at the establishing basis. They're at, uh, not at the, the uh, 
lag phase or the growth phase, they have been established. Populations of four army worms are around here. If there are new resistant alleles coming in, either through uh, selection pressures or through uh, accidental introductions, such as through international trade, we are likely to see the, the resistance happening, uh, the new resistant trade spreading across the population very, very quickly. They do not need to reestablish the population because there is a, an established population there for the alleles to be spread across into the population through mating. You have two more minutes, Tech. Thank you. Uh, so genomic evidence, very quickly, we see that there are evidence of multiple introduction, and this is uh, supported by our work with international partners, such as from INRA, from uh, Brazil, and from China, as well as other Chinese population studies that show that there are multiple introductions. And the gene flow direction is not only from Africa into Asia, but also Asia, such as from China into Africa. So in terms of research gap, we need to understand the selection pressure. If there are single introduction, there must be, there are different selection pressure and how are they moving into Australia and, and are populations moving from Australia back into Southeast Asia under different selection pressure. Genomic uh, approach is, is costly, but it's very informative. It will help us if, if we can develop a SNP-based management tool, we can pro perhaps help the uh, growers understand what population characteristics they're facing. And also there is an ongoing need to understand, oops, to understand population gene flow patterns. And we, Southeast Asia needs a hub for managing and coordinating all research, uh, resistant research management strategies, including for other uh, understanding how four army worms interact with other pests and also for a way to measure the impact of the pests and uh, management strategy. Are, are they making positive impact? So I'd like to thank Croatia. I want to thank Ellison for inviting and our funding agencies, as well as partners, Southeast Asian partners that I mentioned, and also especially our international partners from Brazil, from Uganda and from Inra. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Tech. Uh, really great presentation and um, quite new, I think, for lots of people here who are listening and really interesting to look at the, those, I guess, introduction and those those pathways uh, as well across um, across continents and which direction uh, and then how important that is to understanding how to manage resistance, I think, is very good too. Um, I've got a question here. Just in your initial work, you were looking at your research partners and I know you have a program across Southeast Asia that you talked about. How long will it be until you get really good results that can kind of tell us, well, what's actually happening in those populations of fall army worm is there resistance and and where is it okay uh yes yeah, so we do have about seven international Southeast Asian partners that are looking at bioassays and and also provided uh some of which are have been successful in providing us material for genomic sequencing so the project will officially end in june at that time we would hope that some of our Southeast Asian partner will be able to deliver the bioassay results, and we are currently busy doing the genomic analysis. Now, it's, it's been a challenging 12 months, and everyone sure. will do that it's, uh, due to the uh, pandemic, and then we have all these four army ones. But um, the, the pandemic is impacting on, on our Southeast Asian partner, especially uh, harshly because of movement control, that they can't really go to the work, or they, they can't be too many people in the lab doing the, the exactly. work. So we're not too sure yet. So we do have regular meetings and, and our next meeting is to follow up on whether the bioassay is happening. Uh, Professor Andy Trishano is one of the partners and the email from him is very encouraging. He's currently testing out the, the BT and the, uh, uh, the protein have been successfully delivered to him. Uh, and he's done the the chemical uh, bioassays already. So I think we will get at least very interesting results. In terms of Australian perspective, uh, Indonesia is our closest partners and having Professor Andy 
uh, Tristiano to be able to do all those work to help us to better prepare what's coming into Australia. Is right. Excellent. Just a quick question. You talk about the sort of genomic work and then you talk about the bioassays. What's the difference in cost and what's the difference in, in what you're looking for between the two or what, how you can, the benefits and drawbacks, I guess, just quickly. Yeah, so, so uh, the costs are, are, are difficult to quantify in the sense that like if you do genomics uh, and you have many individuals, you can usually perhaps get a special deal and, and the price is going down all the time. Now, bioassays is different. You have to have the people there to maintain the colonies, to, to make sure that the colony is surviving, and then you need to test them. And if the, the results are, are satisfactory, you have to repeat it. So it's very hard to quantify the, the cost, but the results are, are also quite different because genomic, you can you should have the genomic data to be backed up by bioassays. So okay. both of them need to be conducted side by side. Okay, great, excellent. And I was just going to ask, is Chris Dale, if you can just um, unmute yourself. Chris works uh, for the Government Department of Agriculture, Water and Resources, is it? I'm, I'm going to get that wrong because I, I know it changes the name. Uh, and Environment, Agriculture, Water and, and Environment uh, in Australia. And Chris is also the Chair of a Technical Working Committee under the Global Action on Fall Army Worm. It's the joint IPPC FAO joint committee uh, which I'm a part of too but Chris um, how important is understanding the sort of resistance profiles and, and, and actually then developing resistance management plan for Australia uh, and how important is that to link to the ASEAN work? Thanks Alison and, and good afternoon or good evening everyone. Um, it's very important I guess from a, a government, government perspective as, as Tex sort of pointed out that um, uh, this research is all very uh, interlinked um, and uh, uh, importantly at the national level and at the regional level or the state and territory or jurisdictional right down to the farmer level so that that information flows and uh, we talk about um, surveillance and monitoring and, and essentially that's a, a fundamental part of any national plant protection organisation uh, to be able to coordinate, to be able to advocate uh, for resources and, and research um, and to also, um, as has been you know, very rightly pointed out, uh, to um, lead a lot of the stakeholder coordination. Um, there was also the, the reference around accessing technology and uh, regulatory systems for uh, permits and, and different technologies and systems and that's, that's a fundamental part of uh, government regulatory systems and so I think having that linkage at the, uh, at the, the national uh, government level is really critical. Mm. Um, we also talked about uh, regional um, monitoring and, and coordination and that needs to happen at the government level, government to government uh, and regional level and, and fortunately in the, the ASEAN region we have the, uh, the ACCPC, the Asia Pacific uh, Plant Protection Organisation and, uh, and we have colleagues here from that organisation and that really brings together all of the uh, chief plan protection officers who have the responsibility at the national level to coordinate. So I think it's, it's really critical from a government perspective. Uh, we want to collaborate as much as possible with uh, research institutions, R&D um, organisations and, and facilities, uh, but also advocate very strongly and lead um, at that regional and international level. And that's one of the real opportunities that we have through the FAO and the IPPC work. Great. Thanks, Alison. Thank, thank you, Chris. And Tech, I'm going to leave you now and, and thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, excellent. And I'm sure there'll be lots of people pouring over that tomorrow to, to work out what's what's actually happening. Um, you have a question in the Q&A box. If you could um, just devote a little bit of time to answering that, that would be great. And I will move on to our next speaker. And it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Silvana Paula Moraes from the University of Florida, where she's assistant professor. Uh, I think it's maybe 2 a.m. or or something terrible in the morning. Um, and so she's really made a huge effort to join us. 
Um, but a huge thanks to you. Her research focuses on general area of applied insect ecology uh, and host plant resistance, crop environmental manipulation uh, and characterization of the risk of invasive pests to cropping systems. But she also addresses biology and behavior of insects as applied to insect resistance management, management with a focus on insect movement, host utilization and differential exposure to BT toxins. And I already noted she knows lots of people in the room. I could see her saying hello to Tech and, and others before. So obviously uh, not a stranger uh, in, this, in this discussion. Thank you very much, Silvana. You just need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation to participate in the event. I'm really glad that I had a chance to be here. Right now it's 3.25 a.m. in United States, in Florida, but I'm glad that I had a chance to, to be part of this discussion and attend so many excellent presentations so far. So I, when I was putting together this presentation, I, we had so many, so many topics to talk about fowl armyworm, but I decided to highlight, especially some results of research I have done and important to explain, I have been working with fowl armyworm uh, first in Brazil. I am originally from Brazil. I used to be a research working in lepidopter in row crops. Uh, I did my PhD in Nebraska in north of the United States, where I also had some chance to, to see fowl armyworm arriving late of the season. And since 2016, I have been working in Florida in a transition zone between tropical and timber area. So I can say that I have been, I have been seeing fowl armyworm um, in different crops, especially row crops, maize, cotton, even soybean in my region now. Uh, and my work, as you mentioned, it has been dedicated to divide, uh, develop different IBM tools uh, and also insect resistant management recommendations using insect ecology studies. So, uh, as I said, I work in Brazil. When I returned from my PhD to Brazil, I saw in first hand the resistance to Bt uh, crops, Bt maize, especially cry one f maize, um, uh, resist of fowl armyworm. Uh, cross resistance has been also documented to other Cry1 uh, base maize hybrids. Uh, Cry1 AC never was a high, uh, high dose event to, to fall armyworm. And I mentioned Cry1 AC because it's not in maize, but is high adopted in uh, cotton. And fall armyworm, especially in South America, can be a real problem also for this crop beside other hosts. But I, I should say that I believe that the technology, it is a important tool in the IPM. I believe that is not a silver bullet, but it still has been uh, contributed for the management, not only fowl armyworm, but other target species. What is really important is to put in consideration an insect resistant management program that can avoid all the problems that I saw uh, occurring uh, in Brazil. Uh, when we talk about resistance and when we talk about the effective insect resistant management, uh, not only for fowl armyworm, but my focus here will be in fowl armyworm, we need to put in consideration genetic, ecological, behavioral, and operational fa uh, factors when you're adopting uh, this technology. And I also will be touching base a little bit about use of insecticides against fowl armyworms because sometimes it is a tool that it is important to be considered in different scenarios. And I'm not going to talk about genetics here because of the time and some um, my work in genetics is also especially in collaboration with other research. And the focus here will be especially in ecological, behavioral, and operational factors for fowl armyworm. First thing that I, 
I believe it's really important to a clear understanding of the past occurrence phenology in the area where we are planning to adopt any kind of management against uh, for fowl armyworm. Uh, here in Florida, you can see a graphic of pheromone trapping. I have been seeing pherom, uh, trapping fowl armyworm since I started my program here. I have done the same previously in Brazil. And this information, in my understanding, is critical in order to understand the phenological occurrence of the past in the landscape, agricultural landscape. Uh, this provides information about the critical time of past pressure when it's time to go to sampling fields and also provide information uh, where we should be looking, uh, especially crops that can be more susceptible in the landscape. Uh, as you can see here, I, uh, we have been documenting the surprisingly, the high pressure fowl armyworm in the region where I am is a transition zone, as I said, between tropical and temperate area is especially beginning of the autumn, the fall, when we have a huge population, especially migrating to my region. Uh, important to say fall armyworm, as far as you know, uh, doesn't die a pause. So migratory populations every year reach north of United States mm -hmm. and my region. But for example, in Brazil, when in South America, the species is present all year long in the region because it's a, it's a tropical region where we have the cultivation of the crops all year round and host available for the best. And my pheromone trapping, as I said, has been uh, performed during year round. And the idea is really to document the populations, the occurrence, and also I have been documenting the, the presence of different uh, strains, something that I don't know how much makes sense uh, in Asia, because some studies have been indicated that there are difference in the genetic of the populations that you have right now. Another important information that I think we need to be put in consideration when developing insect re resistant management is related with fowl armyworm oviposition pattern. Uh, in 2014, a paper was published saying that uh, months of fowl armyworm uh, may have a preference to Bt plants because of the injury in OBT plants. Uh, we designed a study in order to see the difference, if there was any difference in preference. And our results in greenhouse and even field level indicate that there is no uh, distinction of Bt and OBT maize plants. And months doesn't uh, discriminate site for, for oviposition, considering the damage in the leaves. This is important information because when you think about recommendations for a refugee area, uh, the presence of damage in refugee areas uh, cannot compromise the, the, the existence of unselected populations in the area. Besides that, we did uh, studies related with the larval movement on plant and plant to plant in order to understand the occurrence of the, the plant, uh, the, the fowl armyworm on the plant in different uh, moments of the crop development and also the level of uh, exposition of the larva when moving on the plant, consider the different expression of Bt toxins uh, during the, in the different tissues of the plant. And larval plant to plant movement, we also document how far fowl armyworm move around. Information also that can help when designing uh, refuge recommendations and especially distance, distance between strips of Bt and OBT corn. Besides that, uh, in 2019, not 2018, sorry, the citation is not correct. We did a literature review in order to list it how the host plants associated reported in literature uh, with fowl armyworm. Uh, we found more than 300 um, plants that can host larva of fowl armyworm in seven, six plant families. So our study also with live table parameters indicates 
a huge biological plasticity of this species. The number of the instances can be variable, depending especially of the temperate conditions. And this defines a uh, success of established of our army worm. And this is why this pest can be so aggressive because it's specific about this biological plasticity. Something important that we need to consider also is that fall armyworm is not only a ear feed pest, it can be also a, a pest during the vegetative stage, even causing dead heart, as you can see in this slide. So we come back again about the information about the occurrence of the pest in the landscape. And when is the critical moment in the region, in your region, when you can have uh, the occurrence of the pest and you can design the, the tools, the management tools that you'll be adopting. We also uh, believe that it's important when you, you're defining your insect resistance management is to list the key pests associated with the region. Fowl armyworm is now an invasive species in the region, uh, but other species already exist in the system. When I talk about other lepidopter or the caterpillars, the interaction, the Intra in, interspecific interaction between these species can define which species, which pests will be predominant in the system. So we know that usually invasive species used to be extremely aggressive because uh, they are new in the system. They do not have natural enemies uh, acting as mortality factors, etc. But I really believe that this is still important uh, to keep on mind that in fowl armyworm you will interact with other species. Just to give an example of uh, several works that we performed in Brazil during the invasion of Helicover parmesia was to understand how Helicover parmesia will be interacting with other lepidopters already present in maize, in cotton. And what we saw was a extremely competitive advantage uh, of fowl armyworm in that case over helicoverpa in general, corneal worm, helicoverpa zea, and helicoverpa armigera. And in the absence of competitor, fowl armyworm also has advantage in the development. The, the larva of fowl armyworm is not that aggressive, but when they go to fight, they, they have a, a higher chance to survive over, for example, helicoverpa armigera. So, I believe this is really important to put in perspective the inter competition and what you expect to be predominant in your region because this can define the tools that you'll be adopting. Something else that we, I know that there are a lot of discussion in the use of biological control, uh, apply biological control uh, against foul army worm. But I think it is really important also to document the natural biological controls that can play an important role in the, in, the, in the management of the insect and reduce the pressure of the population. Uh, just to give an example, in Florida, uh, we recently published a paper where we documented the predation uh, effect of a red important fire ant. This is an invasive species, a pest in urban areas. And we realized that in agroecosystems, agro in the fields like cotton, especially in peanut, this uh, species, fire, uh, import, red, red imported fire ants, it is an important natural enemy uh, uh, against lepidopters such as fowl armyworm and helicoverpa. So I'm not specifically talking about fire ants in your region, but I think this is a, just an example how it is important to understand the system and identify natural enemies that uh, provide natural biological control and somehow you also can incorporate when designing your IPM and your insect resistance management program in order to, for example, adopt selective insecticides or even provide some techniques that can improve the development of the these uh, natural enemies in the system. Two minutes. Uh, okay, so insecticide susceptibility monitor, we talk about, I'm not gonna talk about uh, susceptibility to be T toxins. This is an important point. Uh, I really call attention how it's important to coordinate with different segments, especially industry in order to provide toxins uh, for 
monitoring of susceptibility is really important to have reliable colonies. In the United States, we are lucky enough to, to have uh, companies that you can buy susceptible colonies. Uh, I think it is important to have an organization uh, in different research, in different institutions in order to keep these colonies in lab. Uh, colonies of Lepidoptera is it is not that challenging because you have a natural uh, artificial diet, but there are some safety requirements like avoiding contamination of the scales in the environment, so demand some uh, cleaning environment, etc. And here, just to show what we have done in the Florida Panhandle, this uh, work was published last year, that we have been documented susceptibility to insect sites. Uh, here I show bifetrin, a pyrethroid, and a diamide, chlorandidia pro, and different insect sites, uh, two insect sites against different species that we have been seeing predominant in the system. And doing that, what we can see is that um, we expect the mortality. Sorry, can you please? Silence your microphone. <laughs> okay, I'll keep it going. So uh, here you can see in the result what we were able to do uh, doing curves of dilutions. We were able to uh, document and calculate the expect mortality of each species uh, for the populations that we collect in different regions. Uh, in the case of uh, fowl armyworm, we're still doing the same. This is a work just about to be submitted for publication for Spodoptera isigua, beet armyworm, but we are doing the same for fowl armyworm. And we need to keep on mind is about the stability of resistance and keeping populations, resistant populations in the lab. We have been uh, documenting the susceptibility and how the, the resistance can be stable through the time or not. And this has a extremely importance when we are recommending, for example, rotation of mode of actions, because if you have a, a resistance that is stable through the time, rotation of mode of actions cannot be uh, in recommendations when you have case of resistance. But still, what I'm trying to say here is how important is to understand uh, the susceptibility of the populations and perform different studies and also as Tick just presented using also molecular markers in order to detect um, some, uh, some uh, difference in the susceptibility and markers that can indicate uh, this uh, source of resistance. Uh, one last thing I would like to talk specific about insect size when you talk about uh, we think about use of insecticides against fowl armyworm is how important to understand the behavior of this species. There is a short interval control window before larva establish, especially in during the reproductive stage. Uh, key points when you adopt the insecticide, it is coverage of the feeding sites, a spray volume and the flat nozzle that really helps to target the specific areas of the plant especially the worth of the, the maze. Uh, but rotation of mode of action has been presented here and selectivity of insecticide. And coming back what I mentioned, identify the natural enemies prevalent in the region can also help you to select uh, the best options for your region. So putting everything together, if I can uh, Very summarize. Quickly, Silvana. Okay. Summarize here, I think that insect resistance management needs to be in IPM framework. We need to combine management tactics. Uh, something that I don't have any doubt to say is that one size does not fit all. We need to put in consideration region specific information. You need to know your region because there are different. Uh, different aspects relate with the spatial temporal dynamic of the crops in your region. Uh, besides that, the ecology of the, the past, be, besides the genetics and also behavior of the past. Uh, monitoring system, it is critical in order to understand what's going on. And one last 
aspect here that I don't know how much will be discussed, and I'm not a specialist on that, is understand farmer behavior. In my experience, I saw, for example, the adoption of BT technology, the recommendations for refuge, demands understanding uh, for the, all, everybody involved in the process, coordination, and clear recommendations of insect resistant management tactics in order that can be adopted and can be successful. One classical example is the recommendations for refuge areas, structured refuge areas, and in the case of insect size, uh, rotation of mode of actions, because all these components can contribute for a successful long-term uh, insect resistant management program that can decrease uh, the, 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 the impact of a so aggressive pest as is fowl army worm. Great. Thank you so much, Silvana. That, that's an excellent presentation. Actually introduced lots of new material as well for people to reflect on. Um, I'm going to ask you about three or four questions because we've got to move on. But um, I have a question here and it is, um, uh, the question is, the presence of fall armyworm in Ghana has helped to dis diminish armyworms, I guess other armyworms, and what might be the possible reasons for that? I would say um, the increased use of insecticides, maybe, or maybe farmers more aware about what's going on and be more precise when adopting management uh, against fowl armyworm and indirectly uh, also uh, manage uh, other insects. And of course, um, uh, intergild interaction because we saw this happen for, I saw this, for example, in Brazil, uh, in specific landscapes where we have a predominance of fowl armyworm over Helicoverpa armigera, that in that time was invasive species in fowl armyworm. Besides that, population of natural enemies that can okay. get the lead. Just carrying on from that sort of in intraguild competition, do you think, I think you said they have a do they have a preference or do fall armyworm have a preference for damaged leaves or already damaged leaves? Do you find, or does it not matter? So for example, is there any interaction between uh, where a plant has been damaged by another insect, which therefore makes it more attractive for the fall armyworm? Have you seen that at all? I haven't never seen that. Even though I see difference in the feeding, for, for example, when you compare fowl armyworm versus helicoverpa genus, helicoverpa can, for example, in cotton, they, they, can, they, they have a tendency to, to migrate inside the, for example, the cotton bowl and fowl armyworm, but I have been seeing a more superficial feeding, sometimes preference flowers around, but yeah. no. Okay, Qu quick questions. One will be very easy. Actually, both will be very easy, and then and then we'll move on. One is: Does fall armyworm larvae exhibit cannibalism? Is the first question, and the second question you talked about a short interval control window before establishment. I guess that control window that is very important to get in there fast. How long is that window, in your opinion, or nor on in general? Okay, cannibalists, yeah, extremely cannibalists. And this is one of the issues when you are having colonies because it takes more work to keep them separate, uh, especially after the second Easter. Uh, regarding to the window, uh, it's really important in my understanding to establish a system of, for example, pheromone trapping when you start to see the fly, because once you have the eggs deposit, I would say depend of the temperature of the region, you have three to five days before you have neonates emerging and starting uh, uh, feeding and finding sites for, for feeding in, in the plant. So, yeah. Excellent. Very good. And that's actually really important information, um, that, that management window. So thank you so much, uh, Silvana, for joining us. I mean, it's been fantastic to have you. And it's really important to have that perspective, I think, from, from um, somebody who has been uh, involved in a different region. And we haven't actually heard from somebody from the US or with experience in Brazil yet. So that's been fantastic. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. And I'd now like to introduce uh, our final presentation today. We may run five minutes late today, I'm afraid. I, I apologise for that in, in advance. But I do want to introduce Dr. Kongming Wu from the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences, uh, where he's vice chair of the academy. He's published as an author and a co-author a significant amount of research with a growing focus on fall armyworm since its arrival in China. And Cass has contributed to many of our sessions across the ASEAN Action Plan, sharing their extensive of work and it's a pleasure to have you join me Kong Ming. Can you see your presentation? Yes, that's oh, okay. Mm. Excellent. So you just tell me when you want to move to the next slide. Yeah, so I'm very glad to have this opportunity to introduce uh, so I am for for army worm in China. So what I wanted to talk including two aspects. Uh, the first is uh, for army worm resistance monitoring. So after so the Army worm invade so into China. So we do want to know so what kind of resistant gene so this pest so carried. So we use so genomic so study try to understand this. But the problem is we don't know how many gene mutation related to this resistant so evolution. So but still we find so uh, the some mutation based on so the Publication, so so you, you can find uh, so for OP so uh, insect side so carbonate insect side so we can find uh, so the pest so invade so the carried so this uh, resistant genes. Next, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so for traditional uh, monitoring is uh, so we use this. Uh, regular uh, C to test uh, so the resistance they can find uh, so most uh, so chemical the past already produce uh, resistance so just uh, we find uh, several uh, new chemicals still it's uh, very effective to this invader past next please Yeah, so people are so much concerned. So the BT resistance, you know, in China, so we also so use a lot of BT pesticide. So we do want to use the BT changing cotton cotton to manage the pest. So by our by us, so we find the, the regular so the transgenic so the press the pro protein. The toxin, the carry A B, carry one A C, carry one F, carry A B, and website. So we compare so this, uh, uh, so the dose uh, to the U S. Uh, so uh, baseline, so we can find uh, so the invader population. So it's uh, still uh, susceptible to so the most uh, the B T the toxin. That's please. Yeah, so for emergency, so uh, control, so China, so by our, so monitoring for the resistant, so, so we recommend, so some, so the chemical to use for control, uh, the pest, so particularly for resistant management, we, so ask, so require, the farmer to use different mechanism chemical to uh, take uh, rotation use as well as uh, to mix different mechanism chemical. Next, please. Yeah, so China, so just uh, so last year we uh, so recently register uh, several so the uh, Bio pesticide, so uh, including the BT, yeah, to recommend to farmer to use this bio pesticide to replace some of chemical. Then we want to decrease so the price uh, pressure from chemical, so to delay the resistant evolution speed to chemical. Next, please. So another so important uh, uh, factor is we find that if the larva developed 
develop into more than the third star. So the chemical resistance, so it will increase quickly. So that's uh, we need to get the farmer to use pesticide to control the whole army worm. So, and uh, just in the whole army worm, just hatch so period. So China, so we develop, so uh, for army worm information system. So this system can forecast the population dynamic where so the population migrate, migrate to so how so population density and uh, uh, what time to separate pesticide. Next please. For our early warning system, so one thing we must to do is to dissect uh, the female moths to understand uh, so when the female moths will produce, uh, will lay eggs, then to forecast this, to predict this, to ask uh, the fair farm to spray in the egg stage and uh, also in the first uh, and the second uh, insta stage. In this stage, uh, so I think uh, so uh, both chemical and uh, biosatisticity uh, is uh, very, very effective. Next, please. So about uh, so PT uh, corn, so China already so developed a uh, domestic uh, BT corn. So field try so present uh, indicate uh, this uh, the BT corn. So have a agree. I've just lost Kong Ming, so I'm hoping he will come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just give him a few more seconds. Okay. Kong Ming, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I can't hear you though. Uh, is there someone else? I've lost my. Um, no, I think it, I think everyone may have lost you, Kong Ming. I can't hear you. Oh, there we go. For me, it's not, now uh, it's clear. Uh, Carry on. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Next, next point is. Mm. Yeah. So China still. So we have uh, don't take any decision to commercialize. So this is BT maize, but just take the field study. So we think uh, so the BT variety. So it's on the table. So if we decide, so we can use. Uh, to manage this pest. But uh, for IRM, so we take the study to establish a model to focus the resistant evolution speed. So we think, uh, so based on our product, so now so we use two BT gene plus 20% structured refugee. So we think this uh, two gene and the uh, refugee, maybe so it's uh, a good strategy. So, also, so we prepare so this uh, to follow uh, the BT uh, corn commercialization. Once the government takes the final decision, so we will take, take this strategy to manage this pest. Excellent. So, so I'm very glad to have this opportunity to introduce uh, Chinese uh, so the case study. So we think. Uh, the four army worm, so it's a regional pest, uh, can move from, from one country to another country. So China, so we are, so pay more attention to work together with, uh, so Asia, South Asia country to manage the pest, uh, to manage the population. So we hope, so, so the Croatia can do more soon to organize so the different country together to control the pest to guarantee so the maize uh, the production. So thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you so much, uh, Kongming. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, right on time. We are going to just be five minutes late, everyone, but I just want to ask Kongming maybe two questions. Um, and I see also, Tech, if you're there, there's a question for you in the Q&A uh, box as well. Um, Kongming, firstly, um, you have this monitoring system, which looks very good with 8,000 early uh, warning reports of full armyworm out to farmers. How quickly does that get to farmers, those messages? Yeah, so for China, so for this early warning system, we have a three so level. So for short level, just in one week. So for middle level, it's two week. For three level, it's for uh, so the, the long term level is uh, uh, about uh, three weeks. So mostly, so we can monitor the, the mouse migration and the mouse population in, in, in the field. Then we based on the mouse population and uh, produce uh, egg. Then to give farmer so the gather the information. So I think maybe in one week. Okay, you mentioned also that your you have three biopesticides, I think, on your slide, mm -hmm. um, and the idea is to use more biopesticides uh, along with or with less conventional pesticides. How easy is it to to get farmers to use those biopesticides and and to use them properly? Do you have to provide lots of information, or do farmers adopt the biopesticides quickly? Uh, I think uh, still in China, so it's a great uh, the challenge. So compare with uh, so the chemical, the controlling efficiency from biopesticide uh, it's uh, much lower. So the farmer, so especially the small farmer, dislike uh, so the biopesticide. So for China, so government, uh, so we will give some. Uh, money, some fund to support uh, so the small farmer to okay. yeah to I, I think uh, so uh, just uh, give some special policy yeah okay good answer um here's one question here and then we might close but it, the question is um with the application of myco insecticide against fall armyworm. Does this, or has this been impacted by UV radiation in China? I'm sorry, please repeat your question. I'm not sure myself, but application of myco insecticide against fall armyworm, does this, or is this impacted by UV radiation in China? Not sure that makes that much sense, but I, I've got another question yeah. um, for you perhaps. Um, uh, and it's about the, the BT corn. So at the moment, the, the government is considering the BT corn. Is that is that right? And and you said it will. They need to decide whether they will implement it. How? how I mean, I know you don't know, but how long does that take in general? Uh, so we already take uh, so this field try to for the BT maize. So about uh, two years. So efficiency, so it's uh, very high. So I think this information already, so you so our uh, government, uh, but uh, no one knows so how long and what year so government take the final decision. But I think uh, so uh, it's a potential uh, option. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kongming. Um, once again, fantastic presentation. It's great to have you and, and your team supporting our work and, and um, inputting into many of our programs. Um, fantastic. And thank you for, for sharing your time with us. Thank you. Thank you, Kongming. And I'm going yeah. to introduce Andy back now to give a quick summary. And we're, we're going to be five minutes late overall, which is not too bad, really. Um, I apologize for that. But um, Andy's going to be very brief uh, uh, with his summary, I'm sure. <laughs> Andy, yeah. Yeah. all the pressure is on you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, Alison. Uh, I think it has been a great workshop covering the um, uh, from the molecular aspect to the field practices of precision management. I noted uh, 100 participants attended, uh, attended this workshop and we had a lot of questions and uh, comments. I think it's just the important of this topic. I think the next question is, 
so what and what is the next step that we are going to do so there are three steps that we are going to um, um, to do in the short time uh, the first we will be revising the concept paper based on your feedback so please uh, you can download the concept paper at the address written on the on the on the, on the screen or you can wait um, until Alison send an email to you because I think it was mentioned in the in the chat box that Alison will also uh, email to you uh, about the uh, concept paper. And please provide the written feedback on the concept paper and send it to uh, faw at proasia.org by the 1st of May this year. Second, secure funding and develop the work plan. And uh, the last one, uh, we will be presenting the final concept paper after we uh, finish revising to the Asian Poame One Task Force on the July 13, 2021. So thank you for, very much for everyone who are involving in this workshop. And thank you, Alison. And I turn the floor to you. Thank you very much, Andy, and I'd like to say thank you to all our speakers today. Wonderful presentations. We virtually kept on time. We're only five minutes over, but what a wealth of information, uh, resources, uh, and um, I guess uh, just like good hints on what to do, um, good tips to share, and I'd like to thank you as well, the participants. I think we actually did get up to 180 plus, actually 200 plus in the end uh, for, for the workshop. Um, please, um, please make Make your comments uh, and I will send you the email as Andy uh, as Andy said and take care everyone um, please uh, have a good morning afternoon or night wherever you are across the world thank you very much for your time bye <laughs>